So I'm just going to talk briefly about the format. Um, we're, we're using a format known as Pechakucha or Pechachka, uh, invented in Japan and it's become a worldwide phenomenon. And the format works like this. Each speaker has 20 slides that automatically play for 20 seconds each. And this prevents dreaded speaker hog and the endless delay on the first slide and you're wondering when the speaker is actually going to begin their talk. And allows us to have an incredible program for you with over a dozen um, presentations. Um, just to add pressure, our DJ, Walker's very own Scott Stulen, will be playing a custom chime sound one minute before the end of each speaker's presentation. And this is to create suspense and anxiety among everyone. And you'll know it's almost over. Um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our designers and curators who are here who are going to be speaking today, and they're all listed on the program. There's also many designers in the audience today who came for the opening and are, are here to, to celebrate, and I'd love to just acknowledge them en masse. Thank you for, for being here. Um, and with no further ado, we're going to begin with Andrew Blauvelt. Um, who is the only speaker who is not using the standard format because he, he's a genius and he really started this whole thing and he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. I, although I'm keeping to the timeline, um, do I have to give the signal to go? Is that right? Okay. Um, oh, wait, how did... Okay, hello. <laughs> This is a comment from Steve Jobs, returning from the dead. Um, he changed. <laughs> oh, come on. It's, it's, <laughs> it's been a whole week. I mean. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, wait. I have to control it here. Oh, too bad. So I'm going to talk to you from an essay in the catalog, the lovely catalog, which is now available and on sale, um, and an essay that I wrote, one of many in the catalog, called Tool or Post-Production for the Graphic Designer. The, um, this essay was actually inf influenced by two, uh, I guess, not so designed things, the Whole Earth Catalog and 2001, A Space Odyssey. <laughs> I know, I can't believe it either. Um, <laughs> The title of the essay is actually a riff on James Craig's classic textbook, Production for the Graphic Designer, which shows how old I am. This was first published in 1974 and sought to impart technical knowledge about ink and paper, typesetting, imposition, printing, and binding, the photomechanical aspects of graphic design to graphic designers who, by that point, had be already begun being separated from the reproductive aspects of their practice. Veteran designer Ed Fella created this collage as a practicing quote unquote commercial artist in Detroit in the mid 1970s. It recreates the desktop of a typical designer or production artist of the period, the various tools and implements needed to make graphic design. Fella remarks 30 years later, the only thing left is the coffee. <laughs> Oops, oh, I forgot to advance the slides. Oh God, I'm not doing this right. I'm doing it only on my computer, it's not synced. There it is. All right. Um, <clears throat> with the introduction of the personal computer in the 1980s and its subsequent widespread adoption by graphic designers in the 1990s, the desktop of the designer had shifted from a space of photomechanical reproduction, as seen in Ed's collage, to a virtual desktop, a space of techno-managerial techno activities, complete with the necessary metaphoric icons. The world of burnishers, ruling pens, and exacto knives had been replaced by file folders, a ticking clock, a trash can, and of course, a bomb. Uh, the bomb, of course, is symbolic of the schism created um, even before the computer between the separation of two kinds of labor, between the blue-collar labor of producing and reproducing graphic design and the so-called white labor activities of design conception, design direction, and design management. The computer vir vir uh, vertically sorry, integrated all aspects of creative creation and production, throwing into crisis the role of the graphic designer. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. 
Uh, Hans Holin, an architect, created this collage in 1976 to demonstrate the range of human intervention, invention and specialization of tools, in this case, the hammer. For me, it represents the notion of the designer as both a user of tools and a maker of tools. What distinguishes humans from other animals is not the use of tools, but our ability to integrate them into everyday activities and to adapt and adopt new uses for them. This is the influence from 2001, A Space Odyssey. If you remember the opening sequence, it's the human-like apes who discover the bone, which is both uh, becomes a, a, a weapon, used as a weapon to kill their rivals. <clears throat> Uh, the practice of graphic design is deeply in entwined with creative acts of making as opposed to just doing. This exists historically with, for example, the expertise and skill of designers such as Anthony Valonis, who's up here. <laughs> Um, and the art of silkscreen, in his case, as well as in the revivalist endeavors of today's graphic designers who have seized the means of production in order to ensure that creati the creative act is realized rather than merely managed. Ellen Lupton has a famous quote here, which appears actually in our gallery walls, <clears throat> which I can't read to you because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Go to the gallery and read it. <laughs> and <laughs> Another pioneer, uh, Mariel Cooper, shown here working in a creative environment at the MIT Media Lab, remarked in 1994, which coincidentally is the same year that Netscape Navigator browser launched, which popularized and commercialized the internet. Quote, in the traditional model, the designer tries to interpret what given elements are supposed to do together. So what happens with computers beyond the primitive desktop publishing model on the information highway of all sorts of things that are up for grabs? Authorship, how people read, how people gather and generate material for their own purposes. There she is. Whoops, catching up again. <laughs> there. Uh, the notion of who gets to be a designer is irrelevant today, as the democratization of design software and tools enables the existence of millions, even billions of designers. We now live in an age of user-contributed content and widely distributed platforms. Today, we need a new textbook, post-production for the graphic designer. Uh, like the whole Earth catalog, which Steve Jobs noted to graduating students at Stanford was, quote, like Google before there was Google, unquote, it was a catalog that did not sell any products itself. This countercultural lifestyle Bible had, as it, had at its subhead access to tools, a compendium of techniques, methods, processes, and devices reflective of and embedded in a philosophy of life and work. Post-production for the graphic designer would include the power of the meme, the transmissible, irresistible, reinterpretable idea, rather than the imposition of the brand. The culture of the copy left, not the copyright. Oh, there's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> and the role of the bootleg edition in the age of file sharing. The power of self-publishing to circulate ideas and expose fallacies. The economics of long-tail niche markets over the blockbuster. And the remix and repost culture of contemporary life where authorship lives next and on, next to co-authorship and individuality as part of collectivity. Is graphic design dead, asked Neville Brody, who in his anti-design festival manifesto proclaims from learning to earning and now to yearning, we have forgotten why we are here. We have lost touch with what made us tick, the fire of creative possibility that once consumed us from within. Revolutionary thought is but a distant memory. I grew up as part of the generation that thought it could help improve society, that our sole function was to be conscious and to spread that consciousness through creative awareness, exploration, observation, and questioning. Today, today we ask not of the user of tools as a designer, but the tool designer as a kind of tool maker. And, and a quote here from Jonathan Pucky, instead of collectively <laughs> agreeing to the same streamlined tools sold to us by large software companies, we need to reclaim the personal relationship we used to have with our tools. We need to reintroduce interesting points of friction in our highly optimized software. We must learn to create tools ourselves. After all, the computer is exactly that, a tool for creating tools. There you go. <laughs>
under uh, six set. Um, Richard Scarry takes us through this amazing landscape, and I sort of decided, why, well, why can't there be a graphic designer um, in that world? Um, so I dropped in Stefan Sagmeister there. Um, and this, this, this world that Scarry created is called Busy Town. Um, and everybody is always very busy working. There's lots of work to do in Busy Town, and everybody has lots of tools that they use to do their work. Um, and the whole world is, is wonderfully labeled so that we can understand the incredible um, amount of work that has to be done here in Busy Town by the people that live there. Um, and here are some of those tools um, from, from some years ago. Um, and those of us who are older will remember some of these. And in fact, for many of the, us, they're the reason we didn't want to be graphic designers at all. So things like um, Plaka. Um, this is from Daniel Close's great uh, cartoon from 1991, Art School Confidential, where he depicts becoming a graphic designer as one of the three worst outcomes of an art school education, <laughs> right there with burger flipping um, and working in an art supply store as a clerk. Um, and then, of course, it all changed with the introduction of the uh, personal computer, and this was very exciting because all those tools got stuffed into a little beige box. Um, and this was great, but of course graphic designers were also very afraid. We were afraid that our jobs would become too difficult, um, that we wouldn't be able to learn how to use all these new tools. And we were afraid, of course, that secretaries would, would take our jobs because now they had Times Roman and Helvetica. And this was a very scary thing. Um, and designers do scare easily, and so this was a stressful uh, time uh, for us. Um, but alas, these things did not come to pass, and the graphic design field grew and grew. Um, today there are 250,000 graphic designers working in the U.S. alone. It's the largest design profession um, on earth. Um, and, and many of these, I, I always like to think of Elliot Earls rolling around on a carpet <laughs> somewhere. And our tools just kept getting better. They got brighter and shinier. Even our trash cans became beautiful. Um, and we got to look at pornography on our computers while we were working. And you could fax, scop, copy, and scan on, on one machine. Um, so it was all very exciting, but I don't want to paint uh, too, too happy a picture, so I've sort of created a, a landscape of, of busy town as it has evolved. Um, that, that being so busy all the time is not always a, a good thing when you have to compete with the logo farm over to the west. Um, and it seems that everybody is, is working more um, with less and fewer resources, so here you can see your clients waiting in line for their instant websites and for their um, crowdsourced content um, and, and on all the elements of, of this kind of new tool making which actually devalues a lot of what we do. But perhaps some of these tools are also um, a key to, to saving us. And so, so many designers, especially young designers working with, with fewer resources, or saying, hey, what if I use these tools to make my own stuff instead of making it for the people lined up for their instant graphics? So this is a picture from uh, the New York Artist Book Fair um, showing these uh, publishers actually creating books directly in the fair. And there's a little sign in the corner that says fresh books hourly, which is very exciting. These are Marxist tracts that they're publishing. Um, and so one of the things that we're, we're seeing is is designers um, not just designing a text, but becoming authors and publishers and using the tools of, of distribution and manufacturing um, to, to, to make the thing, but also to get it out into the world. Unclear whether anybody is actually reading all of this output, this outpouring of, of literature, but there's a great kind of social frenzy that goes with it. And then there's very high-end projects like this, which is considered the world's most ambitious cookbook in the history of civilization. It's a 57 pound, five volume, $450 cookbook that is self-published by the author. Or projects like this that take advantage of um, print on demand publishing and in a sense are addressing how to make that, um, that technique into a better tool for designers by creating 
uh, documents that let you actually see what the quality or lack thereof is of the technology. Um, or poster designers like, like, like this, this whole series of posters, which is on view in the exhibition, you can buy in our shop, but you can also order them online um, because they are print-on-demand posters. Um, and so exploiting this um, technology. Um, or the Meharam Digital Projects, uh, which is print-on-demand wall covering, which allows Meharam to um, provide an incredible library of original artwork that is then custom print, printed and formatted to specific architectural environments. So this is not wallpaper as we know it. But it's kind of a new whole way of, of making it fit into life. So, so I'll end with this slide, my final slide. Um, Self-publishing is publishing yourself. Um, there's a lot of motivations for why people create books, and it isn't just to read them, it's also to give them away, to exchange them, to archive them, to put them in libraries, to um, enter into a kind of social relationship that is made possible by this act of publishing, which is now accessible to everybody who has access to tools. I think I beat the chime. All right. Woo! Hello. Hello. Uh, so my name is Armin Vid, and uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit. I'm going to tell you some uh, logo and identity stories. So I'm going to show you some before and afters, some uh, trends, some animations. And they're, they're, most of them come from, uh, from the blog that I run called Brand New. <clears throat> so the first thing that I want to show you is um, what I think is one of the best and most memorable uh, presidential candidate logos, the one for Obama in 2008, which, uh, you know, it's simple, it's memorable, it's identifiable, it's patriotic, it makes for a great sugar cookie, yeah. great Christmas ornament, and more importantly, a great jack-o'-lantern. Uh, the next, uh, this is one of the most uh, hated logos of the decade, the uh, World Fallings for the 2012 Summer Olympics. And the video that you're watching had to be pulled off the internet because people were complaining that it was inducing seizures. You all okay? No seizures? All right. When Starbucks redesigned, the main complaint was, how are we going to know it's uh, Starbucks if it doesn't say Starbucks around the mermaid? So here's a tip. If you're in an establishment that has a green circle logo with a mermaid around it, in it, look around. If they're selling coffee, guess what? It's a Starbucks. <laughs> One day, without any warning whatsoever, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't have to say much. So uh, one day, uh, Gap redesigned. Uh, they gave us that piece of crap. And the whole internet just hated it. And their damage control was worse than, uh, than the damage they had already done. So luckily, they were able to hit Command C on that shit and go back. <clears throat> uh, BP is one of my favorite logos of all time, designed by Lander. But obviously, then the oil spill happened, and that poor logo would never be the same. <laughs> Uh, Petco redesigned their logo and they also changed their headline from where the pets go to where the healthy pets go. Basically saying all you like sick pets go, go to hell. It's as, uh, <laughs> it's as if Target changed their tagline to where the healthy people go, the rest of you can go to Walmart. <laughs> so uh, Home Depot just redesigned, you hear about this? Uh, last week we saw this picture of a checkout machine that uh, it revealed the new logo, but then we started to see uh, some official logos from Home Depot and you know, their gift cards, and uh, no, this isn't real. This is a brand new April, day, uh, April, April Fool's Day job we had uh, this year. So it's just all fake work. <laughs> I would like to ask for 20 seconds of silence as we mourn the death of these classic logos. I said silent. <laughs> Meanwhile, there are logos that just seem to be immortal. And uh, basically, these logos re remain the same as they were in the late 1800s where the when they first came out. Uh, Bass, Coke, uh, G, uh, the next one is four. That one's a little bit uh, later, 1920s. But what's interesting is that they're all script lettering, which is kind of a, a funny uh, thing, and leads me to the next uh, set of slides, which is trends, 
uh, of this year. This is a, a script logo that was a that's Venture 3 for Little Chef in the UK, uh, salt branding for Milica and a rock company, rock company. And then that's a country brand for Peru by Interbrand Argentina. <clears throat> Uh, another trend is like super detailed and super realistic logos, and they look great, but you have to ask yourself, like if someone was trying to fax it on a letterhead to someone else, you know, faxes can barely uh, make text legible. <laughs> How do these things fax? They're just like, <laughs> Or not like that, but you, you get what I'm saying. So this is an avoidable trend. <laughs> <laughs> So designers, if you're designing a logo, you ask yourself, or a friend, does this look like a penis? The answer should be a resounding no. If there's hesitation, that one is never coming back from where it just went. Uh, now turning on to uh, some uh, actual good identity work. This is for Comedy Central, designed by the lab, and I like it so much that I'm gonna dedicate two slides to it. So the idea is that uh, their logo acts like a copyright symbol for funny stuff, so they just slap it whenever something funny happens. It's just right there, the, copy, the Comedy Central symbol. And I think animation is where it's at for identity work. And uh, you know, this is for AOL. If, you, if someone were to tell you that this company that put installer CDs in like bags of cat food to get your grandma to install it, now they look like this, it's pretty amazing. This one I just like to show because it's so pretty. It's uh, Wolf Fallings for Current TV, which is a, a, channel, a TV channel that Al Gore founded a few years ago. That's not part of the movie. <laughs> Uh, this is Logorama, which won the 2010 Oscar for Best Animated Short Film. And it's, it was done by a French team called H5, and it's all done with, a, look, the Walker logo, right where the people walk. It's, it, so it's a, it has a lot of like, funny jokes like that. Uh, you can buy it off, uh, download it off iTunes, and there's a Pringles guy driving. Uh, finally, I want to use my two, last two slides to leave you with a quote from Alfredo Burga of Infinito in Peru, in Peru who I think uh, sums up what designers are meant to do. We believe that we're not in the business of doing identities or packaging or, or environmental design. Uh, that's what we do, actually, and uh, uh, we believe that what we are in the business of doing unique things, things that are interesting, things that are attractive, things that convey a powerful message to worlds, words and pictures, but also uh, uh, I think we, we, we just fulfill the human need to be surprised every now and then also. Um, so we believe in that, we believe in, in these beautiful things that we have to So I hope you find something surprising at the show. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name's Jeremy Leslie. I run a blog called Mag Culture, uh, which covers many, many types of magazines. I'm going to have a look at a few of them today. That's, uh, that's me there, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> I'm already running out of time here on my, on my slides, but um, okay, so uh, it's become a story recently in our industry that magazines are over, magazines are dead, blah, 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 it's this lazy headline, uh, it's like a virus that goes around and today I hope to provide a slight antidote to the big X that gets put, put across printed magazines uh, these days. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples, now I'm having to wait, okay. Um, this is one of my favorite projects. It's upstairs in the show. It, uh, it's, it's everything a magazine is except the content. It is the magazine in form. It's a physical reputation, a representation of a magazine in that it's an A4 piece of wood called Nice Magazine. It was on sale as a magazine in London. Um, but it's everything that a magazine is, and it's, it's a reminder that the physical nature of a magazine is very important. The iPad has that physical nature, but it struggles with the content. The other advantage of... Uh, uh, of the magazine is you don't have to explain it. This is a, a lovely piece by uh, interaction designer um, Koi Vin, uh, which is a parody of the kind of explanation screens you get at the beginning of iPad apps. We know it, it's inherent in books and magazines that it's a usable thing. 
That's not to say that we have to keep the same formats and the same styles of magazines every time. Uh, wallpaper is just one magazine that regu regularly pushes print, and I think it's the job of anybody making magazines or, or working with print these days to push it, to, 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 to challenge what is available online and make the most of print in, 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 in the best way. Um, another example is a small, much smaller magazine from London called Rap, which has a, a dual purpose. It's, uh, it's a magazine about illustration, and you can enjoy... Uh, examples of the illustration plus uh, interviews with the artists but at the end of the day you can you can dissemble the pages and use the the, the large reproductions as wrapping paper uh, of course newspapers are having it much tougher than magazines if we're um, but a lot of them now are looking to magazines to, to reinvent themselves and this is an example from Portugal uh, a magazine called e which uh, uh, is effectively a daily magazine I'm sorry, it's a newspaper that's effectively a daily magazine. And the example on the left here, um, the black and white one, was a uh, celebration of Independence Day in Portugal. But, so they did a retro version of it. Um, but if you're going to do a more traditional type of magazine, you can take on the traditional genres like automobile publishing uh, and, and find your own angle to, to deal with it. And in this case, it's all about... Um, uh, people and, the, and their cars rather than about the cars themselves and it brings a sense of humour to the piece so in, in this example this was a piece about cars wrapped up for winter and, and the headline was uh, cars in their pyjamas <laughs> caught up with myself again <laughs> wasn't expecting this ah here we go um so some magazines have become regarded now as classics, and, uh, but not all, all can boast two golden eras like New, New York magazine. Uh, the original late 60s and the current iteration but, uh, that is built on, the, uh, on that history are both astonishing examples of, of how a magazine can really take advantage of the kind of technology that we've been seeing presented already. Another current example is, uh, is, is uh, Bloomberg Business Week, which has reinvented itself entirely. Uh, and for me, it's at the top of the editorial game. Its front covers are superb examples of, um, of the breakneck creativity needed on a, on a weekly magazine dealing with often quite dry subject matters. There's three examples there. The Steve Jobs one was where they, they, they dropped the live issue and, and created that overnight, and it was on sale at, at the regular time. Um, one of the restrictions that designers and editorial face is, is, is the need to sell on the newsstand. And... Um, uh, so if, you, if, you, if you're producing subscriber-only issues, you, you, you can s strip off a lot of those cell lines. You can simplify them. Uh, I'll have to jump ahead now. Um, O32C is, it rebels against this, this uh, high design. This, this, uh, if we're looking at New York and Bloomberg Disney, uh, Business Week, beautifully designed using the latest technology. O32C strips that away and, and plays with, what might, with ideas of what is beautiful and what is ugly and what is good design even more extreme on the inside in this example where the use of system fonts rather than the carefully selected bespoke typography and the uncomfortably spaced kerning and the colour clashes are all intended to challenge the reader and make them feel uneasy and in a, in, in a curious roundabout way make more attention for itself than, than the more slickly beautiful design that, that we might, might be more used to. Uh, and of course there is great content online too and he, but even here things aren't always what they seem. Uh, I'm sure some of you know the blog It's Nice That, operating from, Lo from London, which uh, covers the creative world. But as well as the blog, they, they recently launched uh, a printed uh, version, uh, the thinking being that there are two very distinct modes of, of, of content. Uh, I run a blog, and the other guys here I, I, I know feel the same. The blogs are a very hungry beast. You need to pour lots of content into them. And with, with the best will in the world, you put some stuff in there that maybe isn't as, as worthy as, as other stuff, whereas... Once you, once you commit to print, you have to be much more edited and much more sen uh, sensitive to what you're actually uh, producing. Do they just get longer? or? Um, and we're beginning to see now some interesting editorial I iPad apps. Um, these are two examples which you'll see upstairs. Um, uh, Moral Tales is, is, a, is an edition of Letter to Jane, which is a kind of a contained magazine experience, whereas the Guardian app, which was released last week, is, is a fantastic daily up, 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 upload of, your, of, of the newspaper of the same name. Flipboard is the third example, and this does something different, seamlessly combining social network feeds with uh, more uh, moderated content from magazines and, and, and other sources. 
Uh, I, I, I love my iPad. I find it a very different experience. And editorially, it's, it's yet to really challenge what, what, what you can do in, in print. Uh, but can print compete with such apps? Well, I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it can. I mean, magazines have always been about community and sharing. Uh, and there's no reason why they can't continue to, 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 to take advantage and work with digital. And this is one example where I think they've applied a kind of user-generated content to a print magazine for a city guide where, they, where, where individuals have um, a say in the content. Uh, so is print dead? No, there's plenty more antidote upstairs as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ian Albinson. I run a website uh, called Art of the Title, and I'm the curator for the title design section of the show. Uh, the site explores the creative process uh, to do with title design uh, with long-form interviews. And the video that's coming up is a brief history of title design, something I made for South by Southwest. With luck. Ah. So expanding on that, uh, the title design or title cards began as just dialogue and plot cards for films. Uh, then they transitioned to title cards with simple lettering and type design. They began to expand later on with more interesting sort of use of uh, type in film as well as the idea of an opening title sequence. Uh, Saul Bass comes along in the 1950s and uh, starts to bring his own experience as a graphic designer into film, working with filmmakers such as Hitchcock and Preminger, uh, and begins to make title sequences a unique part of the film, not just a title card. Uh, following on from Bass, you have a number of designers like Pablo Ferro or Stephen Frankfurt with To Kill a Mockingbird, as well as later on you have uh, Richard Greenberg uh, and his company RGA, who start to use sort of analog and digital uh, tools to make title sequences for Superman and Alien. Uh, in the 70s, you sort of have a pushback in title design uh, with a lot of new filmmakers like Coppola and Spielberg who don't really use titles as such, 
Um, it's more sort of documentary European style filmmaking, but in the 80s, you start to see more of a branding and logo based approach, and it's title cards versus a title sequence. Uh, in 1995, this changes, much like Bass in the 50s, you have a designer called Kyle Cooper whose breakthrough work comes with Seven, working with David Fincher uh, on a title sequence for that film that sort of rejuvenates uh, the idea of using main titles uh, as an important part of the film. Uh, in the next few years, his company, Imaginary Forces, which separated from RGA and Richard Greenberg earlier, uh, sort of reintroduces the power of title design to a number of different filmmakers, and they have a tremendous output in uh, a number of short years. Um, at the same time, you have technology and computers uh, getting cheaper, and so you start to see, uh, with this access to cheaper, cheaper technology, the ability is available to anyone to create high-quality work for film. Uh, and so you see an explosion of designers who are using that technology uh, in any number of films to create opening title sequences or end title sequences. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, premium cable channels uh, coming to the forefront who start to produce their own original content, like HBO, who used to show films. Now they're producing series. And along with that, you have uh, title design coming along with material that they want to be film-like. Uh, at this point in time, you've got uh, a number of title designers and studios, uh, the demand is multiplied uh, because of the interest in title design. So the logos you see here are all studios and designers that produce title sequences as well as other types of uh, digital media. Uh, and now, with this exhibition, it seems that title design is really beginning to resonate with the public uh, more than it has ever before, and there's enough interest and awareness in title design that it sort of firmly needs to have a place uh, in graphic design history. And there we go. Hi, I'm Karen Fong. I'm a director and designer at Imaginary Forces. Thank you so much for that, Ian. I'm going to actually walk you through a case study of one of the titles that is upstairs. It is the TV title of Rubicon. And that design process started with a meeting between myself and um, the show's uh, creators, Henry Bromell and Jason Horwood. And they had uh, created a show where you were following a CIA type CIA type intelligence um, agency, and they were very much inspired by the psycho thrillers of the, of the uh, 60s and 70s, and were very much interested in creating a graphic language in which all these people are seen, you know, trying to do their best at pattern recognition and, and trying to find, you know, hints of conspiracies in the most mundane things. In fact, Jason, at the first meeting, one of the first things he showed me was the book on infrastructure and the idea that we're all, you know, cogs in the machine and the machine is providing us our transportation transportation, our water, our food, our fuel, all of these things were dependent on them. So how could we show that, you know, um, that we, you know, we, there might be some plots and government um, conspiracies on that level. One very um, influential um, uh, inspirant, uh, influence on me is Tufty's books. And the main character actually has the diagram of Napoleon's march to the east, which is up there on the uh, right corner in his office. And so that was the great jumping off point to study these infographics. Like this character um, would be somebody who would examine the Tokyo train schedules for possible patterns and leads. Another influence is the photographer Taryn Simon. And she kind of like photographs the back office of the America. You know, those are nuclear waste containers on the bottom, a bottle of HIV on the right, you know, she just kind of gets that weird angle of American bureaucracy and our system in a, in a sort of very strange visual way. Oh, a question right there, yes. It was a very good question. Um, you know, how, and that really, really uh, varies, frankly. Sometimes, you know, uh, 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 an idea will pop into your head and it'll seem so right for a show that you just go in there and you work with the creators and the filmmakers and say, this is it. Other times, at the same time I was working on this project, I was working on the titles for something else where I was presenting 10 ideas. But this right here would be a storyboard I would present in a meeting where I would show the ideas and the concepts. Um, and the idea came pretty quickly that we wanted to use sort of analog technology. Note, this is a show that takes place today in today's time. But I think really our minds, and when we think of like pouring through materials, 
we're very much connected with the idea of um, looking at slides on a light table or, or, or scanning through microfiche. And the characters in the show all have little bits of pieces of paper and they're drawing diagrams and, and putting them up on bulletin boards and you know, trying to figure out you know, if there's any sort of secret messages in the want ads and the crossword puzzles. Um, and you know, so, so kind of combining that kind of data together, and it's kind of stripping it down. Actually, uh, was one of the challenges, and was one of the one of the things um, we really wanted to do. And I found that it was great that these filmmakers were great supporters of making something abstract. It was very uh, definitely not about showing the locations of the show or the cast of the show, but more of the bigger idea that uh, what these characters were thinking of and how they were, um, you know, what, what ideas they had. This is called an animatic. I work with an editor, our team works with an editor, um, to put together the images for the first time and see how they might work together um, and the pacing. And this was very much influenced by the um, parallax view, which has a brainwashing sequence in it. And it's, at one point we thought, well, maybe we'll work in some subliminal messages in the credits. Ah, uh, well. You know, that's, they, they did, they yes and no. <laughs> the, the clients did go for it. They liked the idea of a very, very distinct digital, uh, visual language. But one thing, you know, you always have to remember when you're designing these things is what is the emotional connection to the characters? How, how does it make the audience feel? And there was a concern up at AMC, the network, that maybe we were getting a little cerebral. Maybe it felt like a math show. Um, the idea, I mean, look, these people are looking in the newspaper and receipts and things and trying to figure out if there's going to be a plane crash soon or a terrorist attack. It's just Shouldn't it feel a little bit more immediate? Shouldn't it feel like a little more scary? Shouldn't it feel more threatening? Um, so it was kind of like back and taking a step back and saying, you know, let's Google conspiracy, see what comes up. Um, <laughs> right here is a, a board by Jeremy Cox that kind of um, addresses that. It, 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 we look at the language of redacted documents and that, that gives you the advantage of being able to pull out different pieces of type and really make it very immediate. Another significant addition to this round of storyboards is the idea of highlighting lighting things with a yellow line. And now you have a character, you're in a character's mind. Instead of relying on the audience to make these, you know, uh, read into these juxtapositions wholly, you're like seeing somebody's mad sort of like, you know, um, you know, assumptions being played out in front of you and that makes it much more immediate, like, you know, that you feel like you're inside a character's mind, you feel like you're partaking, yeah. About the, yes, yes, that's a very important question about the music. That, I would say that maybe like 80 or 90% of the emotional content comes from the music. And you might have noticed in the animatics that I sh uh, show that we aren't using the final music. They're taken from other shows and from other films. Um, and so what we do is we'll temporarily take something, like here, and set the storyboard to it. Meanwhile, the composer, the music supervisor, in this case the composer, is composing music custom for it. So we're going a little bit of a back and forth here. This isn't the final piece. You can see that um, upstairs um, after, after this. And, but this was, you know, sort of like a sketch. It's sort of a, a sketch in motion. Oh, well, yes, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I think we have a question for the question in the back. Yes. Title design is actually really relevant to the rest of my work, uh, or anybody working in film and video, because, um, you know, for instance, I direct and design um, television, commercial, uh, other sequences, such as dream sequences for films, things for uh, sequences, storytelling sequences for video games. And what you're really doing in title design uh, is really taking a lot of ideas and, and making them into an icon. You're making something that should be memorable, that lives on beyond maybe the individual segments of content beyond the film but takes a lot of the ideas and, and almost like the, the monolith in 2001 lives beyond all these things and become, can become a, grand, a, a bigger symbol of all of the ideas and the themes. And yes, I, yes that, is a, you know, that is a great question. And <laughs> I definitely am excited about the influence of graphic design in film and video. I, I think it's uh, be because of the tools, things are getting more sophisticated that you can combine type, um, live action, animation, illustration in a way that is seamless and it's incredibly inspiring. There's nothing better than I like a blank screen to um, be able to create for. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage, I can afford a carriage, but you look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. 
The words of that song were the first words of the HAL 9000 computer in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. By the use of the by now famous jump cut, the director Stanley Kubrick posits that HAL is a direct descendant of the first tool of man, an animal bone. Luss has always had a keen interest in how tools, technology, and language can be an impetus for graphic design. We are interested in exploring new pathways at the crossroads of new media, information technologies, architectural and urban systems, and graphic design and typography. Each of these disciplines has a unique and inherent vocabulary. Is there a meta-language that binds them together? So there can't be any discussion about meta-language without mentioning renowned American linguist Noam Chomsky. He is a proponent of gener generative linguistics, which is a set of rules to determine and predict syntactic structure. That's him. Um, so there are two ideas uh, in general linguistics that I feel directly relate to meta-language and design. The first is phonemes and morphemes, which is the difference between a sound which has different phonemes for each iteration of use, such as the T here, or one in which its morphology changes for each iteration, such as the plural S. I interpret this as the metaphorical difference between the symbol itself and the meanings a set of symbols may mean. Why are we as designers still concerned with what these symbols look like, i.e. form, when we probably should be concerned with developing a new design morphology to fit the contemporary world we live in? Let me give an example. In an age of efficient personal messaging, why are we still designing posters? Or should posters take on a new role in the cityscape? The text message, for example, is a more efficient medium which can speak directly to the audience one-to-one, -one, but maybe lacks typographic differentiation. In this scenario, how can you put emphasis on specific parts of a message, i.e. you can't make bold text in an SMS message, text bold, then becomes an exercise in morphology instead of form. So for example, you restructure the content. Um, you repeat it, come, 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 come come to the walker. Or you can also distribute or redistribute the content. So you send each word then as a separate text message. Come <laughs> to the walker. The second concept related to Chomsky's general linguistics is recursion. In general linguistics, recursion is embedding a sentence in a sentence. This enables the ability uh, to describe an infinite number of concepts, thoughts, and ideas. The most complex languages contain recursion. At last, we use similar recursive systems and processes in our design methodology. For example, that what you just saw was Charles and Ray Eames's parts of 10, and this is, of course, a Fibonacci sequence. At LUST, we also often talk about the vocabulary of a project. During the research phase of a project, we don't just design. We just try to build the vocabulary of the project, each sketch or idea embodying a new word. The richer the words, the more elegant the sentence we can speak. In Chomsky's linguistic model, the letter S signifies the speaker, the subject. His linguistic trees always begin with an S. In A Thousand Plateaus by Deleuze and Guattari, they propose that the S becomes then more of a marker of power than a syntactic marker. You will construct grammatically correct sentences. You will divide each statement into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. This they criticize is a limited view, stating that while seemingly abstract, it is in fact not abstract enough. Chomsky's hierarchic model cannot describe a complex contemporary non-hierarchic world. Literary critics such as Roland Barthes use analytical devices or codes to deconstruct literary text. We too can use similar methodologies to lay bare the semantic structure of a piece of text, except instead of using li literature as our medium, we prefer to use the ever-growing stream of data we as a digital society produce. And instead of using literary methods of crit critical analysis, we can then use digital tools, such as code and databases to mark large sets of language and at a more empirical level. So what is the smallest building map of graphic design? When a graphic designer folds paper, is there an equivalent to an information designing folding data or an architect folding space. 
This is Fuller's dimension map, a projection of the world on a flat space. But the, the more the polyhedrons are, it contains, the more it can then approach a perfect sphere. The map then represents the metaphorical difference where 2D, 3D, and 4D space meet. Recursiveness then becomes the key element enabling a folded out flat space representation as well as a 3D model of space as the amount of polyhedrons increases. The defining parameters can then be such factors as the zoom and scale of powers of time or the Fibonacci sequence or a sound. In the short story by, by Borges, the Aleph, the narrator talks about the Aleph in a po as a point in space no bigger than a dot in which all points in space converge, let's say the ultimate recursive jump cut, encapsulated in a metaphorical tripographical symbol, the period, the simultaneous end and beginning of time and space. Towards the end of the story, the narrator is able to view the Aleph, and it is at this tragic moment of revelation that the narrator then takes us on the role of the, then takes on the role of the Chomsky and S and discovers its failings, as predicted by Deleuze and Guattari. For the narrator st states that language, being a set of symbols shared by speakers with a common history, failed to enable him to describe what his eyes see, and that is, an entity of limited scope and infinite meaning. It is then design hubris to think that a meta language can describe the indescribable. Thank you. Hi. So here's a quote from the catalog about Metahaven, written by Ellen Lupton. Few collectives have achieved more notoriety than the Amsterdam-based partnership Metahaven. And notoriety is, of course, a state of being known for some unfavorable act or quality. <laughs> so what have we done? Um, so we're going to talk about one single project, which was a book that we published last year with uh, Lars Muller. So this is a, a kind of monograph that doesn't want to be a monograph. It's a love-hate manual in the uh, on the state of design and the design of states. Um, and this is not really self-publishing. I think we, we, lo we love self-publishing, but ultimately with the type of work that we do, it's important that you find partners, you know, that, that you don't sort of put it out all yourself, but that there's actually people who sort of believe in it a little bit or like it or appreciate it who can help you. So this is what the book is about. Uncorporate identity is the title, and that describes also the tension, I, I guess, in which, which our work takes place largely. It's that situation of love and hate, and the situation that you want to sort of examine branding, and it's sort of the moment that it converges into politics. And I think that the thing that, you know, has been, should be underlined, is that design has not only a technological, but also a political dimension, and that's the dimension that we're mostly interested in and that we could explore in this book. So the book contains, it's actually five chapters, chapter one, two, three, three and a half, and four. Um, and and um, each chapter is sort of adorned with like projects that we did and writings. So this is a, one of our earlier projects, which was about you know, state branding. We branded a island state called Sealand. I like the slide function here how it's going, I could like, it's a touch screen actually, I'll show it later. This is a kind of iconography for Sealand that we designed. And you can see that our aesthetic preference at that time was very much about, you know, challenging a sort of, you know, prevailing sort of minimalist aesthetic, you know, that was going on in design. Uh, and the idea of piracy and tax havens is also very important to us. Uh, these are credit cards for, let's say, banks that only have a, have a kind of mailing address, but no, not really have employees or anything like that, let alone, you know, uh, money. So this is actually the financial system as it currently stands, right? It is just a kind of a piece of fiction, right? So that's, that's also an interesting thing that we're like into exploring. And writing, uh, writing letters, love letters sometimes. Um, uh, writing as a medium to express your thoughts, you know, in a way that doesn't necessarily need to be academic or whatever, you know, it's about, it's really about um, doing research as makers and by making, and, and writing is making as well. So uh, from that, you know, vantage point, we could really sort of starting to peek into the, the, the nation state as a sort of carrier of legitimacy, you know, as long as you have a national flag on it, you know, you can, the ship can carry anything, basically. And that's, that's one thing that we started to sort of unveil a little bit uh, together with our collaborators in, in, in uncorporate identity. And 
what is uncorporate identity? This particular page is about the visual legacies of 9-11 and the unmarked jets that the CIA sent around the world to transport extra legal detainees. So the, the very lack of an identity, the very lack of a logo is in fact the logo. That is in fact what makes an uncorporate identity. You know, it is the, the power of stealth, really. Um, the idea of borders, you know, Europe uh, is an important topic. It was before, you know, the current problems in the Eurozone started to turn up as they, as they now sort of come to a kind of climax. And we talk more about, you know, the fortress Europe, the idea of the, the you know, Europe being sort of protected and branded space. Um, and this is actually also visible in, in cities in Europe. So we created a monopoly game um, made out of Paris. So Paris became this sort of monopoly board and all you could do was really just sort of circle around the center without ever getting in. That's pretty much the reality of you know, people who live in Paris. They can't afford to live in the space that's actually the city of Paris, right? Um, it's also a matter of like, okay, how, do you, how are you visual about these types of thoughts, you know? And it's a kind of rather angular, abstract world, a very inspiring talk by Thomas, this sort of abstract space of language, you could also make that into a game board, you know. Many, many of the situations that we're facing are, are actual games. So this is chapter three and a half that we're in now, and chapter four is, is actually trying to grapple with, with the idea of the branded state and the sort of upcoming power of, of branding as a form of standardization that we think is closely related to the sort of, you know, the transgression that we're currently seeing towards social media. And that in fact, you know, in a sort of soft power system where, you know, people are trying to be likable and have a good reputation, in fact, you know, social media slowly starts to supplant branding and corporate identity. So the, the idea of reputation management becomes, becomes very important. Does it make sense to think about these sort of, sort of things and to work with them as a graphic designer? Yes, it does, because these are the forces that shape also eventually the, the, the client commissions, you know, that, that come out of, you know, the, the relationship of graphic design with reality. So this is one other, you know, project that's called Stadtsta that, that is in, in a way related to what we're, what we're showing upstairs in the gallery, uh, a project called Face State, which really takes Facebook as a state. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as we sort of, you know, move through the book, it's over 600 pages. So, you know, it's uh, get it at the library or, or order it on Amazon. I mean, it's it's, it's too expensive. It's a, it's a Swiss publisher, you know, and the different rules in Switzerland uh, for how expensive a book should be. So, um, uh, I mean, we believe in books. We believe in the future of the book as well. But, but of course, you know, the real force that's shaping the future of the book is still the internet. You know, if there's no, not, no one talks about your book on the internet, you know, it's like it's, as if the book doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, just, just, just going one more thing about that social media thing. When, uh, when um, uh, Bloomberg Bus Business Week uh, asked us last year to rebrand AIG, and here we had, we had our proposal to where the old AIG logo would sort of disappear in a new logo and all kinds of you know, social media references would turn up in the sense of like that it all becomes just a matter of reputation management, um, which is what a rebranding also has become. So, and now finally, an announcement to make our forthcoming book, Black Transparency, designed in the age of WikiLeaks and Anonymous to be published next year by Akhtar. And thank you so much. Andrew, Alan, Dylan, Emmett, and everyone at the Walker for the incredible support. And I think I speak for all the other speakers, uh, designers here, of how grateful we are. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Daniel Etok. Um, this is the first project I made when I worked at the Walker Art Center. I worked here 11 years ago. And at the end of 98, when I began, I was asked to design the Christmas card. Um, I loved making Christmas cards, so it was a perfect first job. Um, oh, it's gone too quick. Okay, um, I, I won't have a chance to talk about every work that's on the slides. Um, so some things I can talk about. This is a metronome and a waving cat. <laughs> I think when it, when it would, it needs to move, but it's a diagram for a work which is not yet made. Um, this is a, a swivel chair with um, a flashing light. Again, it's a diagram for, for an unmade work. And this is a poster. Um, I think it was a second project I made at the Walker Art Center. So you put a push pin on the red dot and then you'd have to spin the poster around 
to read the text, and it was a text that was um, looking for a new curatorial intern. Um, this is a, a diagram for an unmade sculpture. It's a, a wheelbarrow on a treadmill. So the, the front wheel would, would go around. But I like the handles, the grips, this kind of um, connection. And this, is, this woman's dress matches the tablecloth. <laughs> I took this picture um, across the road from the walker in, I think it was in 99. It's called Aerial View. So I, I held my camera directly over the car aerial uh, and took a picture down. It's one of a uh, series. Um, but I'm really interested in viewpoints, how something can change just by you know, a simple reorientation. So this is scales that are being adjusted, but not by adding something on the top, but by jacking uh, up. This was a sign that I noticed in London. Um, so the, I like that the content of the sign matches the physical form of the sign. So it tells you that something's kind of narrowing. And in this case, the, the, the leg of the sign was damaged. So it kind of, there's a nice kind of uh, relationship. <laughs> two similar things. One is an unmade um, proposal for a living sculpture. So two creatures that carry the homes on the back. And the other one is, uh, a diagram of a card on a card. So I think about this like two mirrors facing each other. So when you, when you position two mirrors against each other, it creates an infinite space. Um, pointed things. So this is a cactus planted in a stiletto. Uh, and this is uh, one pair. <laughs> I wasn't sure how many things to put on each slide. I, okay, this was a Walker project. It was a commemorative gift for um, people that had been working at the Walker for 10 years. So I made the sentence and the 10 is in the position of the 10. This is the halfway slide and this is a card that you can write a reason why it's late for the recipient that you send the card to. <laughs> this is untested, but I would if I ever get invited to DJ, I would like to try to put a helium balloon connected to the, the arm of the record. And because these things are always balanced, just so the needle has the right uh, amount of weight to rest in the record groove. But if you adjust that balance, the needle would, it, it would skit across the surface and kind of remix the track. And this is a telescopic car aerial with a, uh, a car, because well, coat hangers often become temporary car aerials. So I like this kind of fusion object. And this, again, was a, a, a piece that I made at the Walker. This is a, a cocktail glass and an umbrella. <laughs> I could have put another piece on this slide. <laughs> These are tripods, and um, this is a, a work that a friend emailed me. So he said, I don't know if this is on your radar or not, but my lunches today look like the forthcoming Gustav Mertzer show invite from the Serpentine. <laughs> I really like this kind of connection. It was salted cod and potato with baked beans. <laughs> this was, um, I think it was one of the last projects I made at the Walker. It was the Millennium um, Christmas card kind of the transition from 1999 to 2000. So these little white things that you can't quite read, there are 1,999 1999s and 2,000 2000s, and the two kind of came together. This is a, a challenge which I haven't done. So I would like to get a video camera and a flashing light and then try and sync on, off, on, off with the flash of the light to try and get a film that's only orange. So it's... <laughs> Do you know, and you'll be in and out of phase, but it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> We're on fi uh, slide 15. So 20 minus 5 are the same number of letters as the answer. And this is uh, a unicycle with stabilizers. <laughs> so it still doesn't work. Um, that went very nice with the snow. This was... Um, uh, I made a bunch of things in snow. It's really nice to make something which wouldn't last for very long. 
So I've seen how, how high I could balance things. And this is a rolling pin with handlebar grips. <laughs> These are, um, I, I invite people to take a photograph where they touch the lens of the camera. Have a, a collection of these photographs. Because um, really you don't want to touch the lens because you get a greasy print. But the, the quality is really beautiful. So the, the gold as a light kind of comes through the skin. You get these really nice images. This is my last slide. These are um, a proposal for door signs. At the walker, when I approach the door, it says push and pull. But I'm reading the, the one on the other side through the glass and I get so confused. So I thought it'd be nice to, to make these in brass and put them on the door. So as you approach it, you're not sure if you're reading it from the other side. <laughs> but um, that's it. Thank you. So this is for uh, Julia Lepton. Um, this is a rough draft of a project that's a work in progress, looking at the future of humanities research and scholarly production. This is how Trina liked to do her work, in a little house in the desert, out of earshot, and in total isolation. The presence of other people, the fleshy nearness of them, weighed her down, prevented her from wafting untrammeled through the thin, ghostly infosphere, thinner and ghostlier as the technology evolved. Sometimes she heard the boom of guns from the nearby marine base, as when, today, she was crowdsourcing for the NSA. It brought her back to the real world with a guilty jolt. But this assignment was archive analysis, nothing to do with today's wars, an encrypted document that may have been generated by a secret writing machine during World War I. She wished she could hold the paper up to the window and take an old-fashioned look-see, but the original had been destroyed years ago. To be honest, it didn't strike her right away as war communication. There was something odd about it, unsystematized, accidental. Visually, it was a mess, a palimpsest, as researchers call it. Luckily, her dig feature could peel away the layers, find the one with the message. But first things first. She ran the only recognizable character she could see through the writing machine detector. Remington typewriter, 1873, a test prototype only used in-house at Remington and Sons. Just as she'd suspected, nothing to do with war intelligence. But the rest of the results surprised her. No known keyboard, that's odd. She stared into the distance. How was that possible? All the keyboard configurations ever tested at Remington had been identified. She knew that from her dissertation research. So she grabbed at the air to call up Dig to see what it would reveal. A casual observer passing by the property might have thought she was waving or dancing or mad. But nobody ever passed by out there except for jackrabbits and the occasional coyote. The top layer held only X's, so she kept on going to the next layer, opening and closing her hands like crab claws to digitally peel each one away. Layer two looked like gibberish. She ran the text through all known cryptography keys and turned up nothing. She pushed through to the bottom. And the last layer assembled before her eyes. A standard business letter. Okay, yes, but not about typewriters. Wiki simple, Remington and Sons, V, she said aloud. Remington sold guns first, under the direction of oldest son Philo, before they diversified into typewriters, assigned to Eliphalet Remington, the youngest, the system said in words that no one could hear but her. Ah, uh, yes, guns. How could she have forgotten that? So maybe it was a war document after all, only of a different kind. Confirmation of receipt of payment, money for arms, or was that a mask, a metaphor for another kind of operation? Maybe the exchange of intelligence. On a hunch, she returned to the second layer. She could analyze the fragments at the bottom to identify quite precisely what genre of text they might 
be. She squinted at the name Hipperholm Grammar School, a signal that the eye tracker recognized as show more. She looked at the motto. Not exactly a military sentiment. Was it another mask, another metaphor? Doctrina, doctrina, she muttered to herself. There had to be something more. On a whim, she input the words into a biographical database, and it turned up a single modest entry. Funny things with type, like incorporating text from a typing manual into her poetry. Hmm. The low coo of a Skype call pierced the silence. Trina, have you eaten anything today? It was Marjorie. Oh, great. Before she could answer, Marjorie continued, eyes wandering away from her impatiently. Oh, I see you're in the desert. I thought we'd agreed you weren't going out there. It's really not the best environment, considering the fragile state you're in. Oh, well, hello to you too, Trina said. I'm working. And I'm fine. You're not fine, Marjorie countered. But that's OK. But you need to be around other people. What are you talking about? There are loads of people here, Trina snapped, gesturing to the faces fading in and out at the edges of her vision. Marjorie sighed. And where exactly is here? Trina switched subjects, describing her research and the results it had yielded thus far. She hated to admit she was hungry after all. I was looking for a military connection. It's an NSA job, but I don't think there is one. Or if there is, it's metaphorical somehow. Or could be I've stumbled on this woman's long lost poetry. Marjorie was silent for a moment, then stared at her head on. Doctrina, well that rings a bell, Marjorie said. It does, Trina asked eagerly. Oh sure, she said, smiling widely. Doctrina, Trina? Trina resisted the urge to roll her eyes. With her eye tracker on, who knows where in the infosphere she would have landed. She reached for some leftovers and then thought better of it. Oh, come on. You think this is all a projection? You're conflicted about continuing hit work for the NSA, aren't you? Marjorie asked. What if they send you another job like the Afghanistan one? I have facts, Marjorie. I'm not making any of this up. I know, but it's how you're interpreting the facts that concerns me. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we're the principals of Project Projects. And uh, I guess we wanted to just talk a little bit today. We, we have a funny role in this thing because we're both in the show, but we're also going to be designing the New York version of the show. And so we wanted to talk about some projects that somehow play a role in this idea of an expanded practice of design. Um, this is a picture of our space in New York. And uh, one of the things that we've been very interested in in designing exhibitions is how you can actually create a participatory space, a space that not only can present work, but can also involve other people in, in some ways. This is a show that we designed together with Ken Saylor, an architect in New York that actually built into it a blackboard painted wall. Uh, the entire uh, exhibition actually had a way in which people could draw on it, could add to it, or sometimes a show that eats itself, a show about branding, but in a critical way where actually everybody who enters into the show is asked to make a choice between red and blue, and then the detritus of the show actually starts to erode the branding of the show itself, something where actually graph design functions as an intervention, a kind of threshold. I mean, I think that one of the things that's interesting about making a design exhibition at all is the idea that the design frames the thing. It frames the content in a particular way and conditions how people respond to it. And so trying to think of ways in which actually people visiting exhibitions start to have an ability to rearrange the exhibition or use it in a lot of different ways. Use it as a platform or a space for events or other kinds of things to happen. Um, and also how an exhibition space might become a, a place for production itself, a kind of workshop or a place where people People can think about politics and urban planning in a number of ways. This slide is going for a very long time. Um, 
But uh, thinking about how, as I said, um, people can be involved in these kinds of spaces and actually change them. Uh, and that becomes a very interesting point with graphic design in particular, which always lives in a context. It always has some sort of natural context outside of the gallery that we have to consider in how it's presented. Um, but one of the other things is that for us, we also think about there's a really critical way in which we have to think about participation, because participation can often be a cover for coercion within a political context. And by looking at kind of historical examples of this, I think we begin to think about um, both the, the uh, good things and the pitfalls of participation and how we can be aware of that. Hello, Minneapolis. <laughs> it's good to be back here. Um, so moving on, so the, uh, when, we, when we've been commissioned by clients to do uh, jobs such as the Whitney Biennial Catalog, uh, where there's a kind of clear program, you're supposed to design a catalog that shows a bunch of art. And it, we sort of like to graft onto it the secondary, oh my god, the second, uh, this additional layer of content. So I'll skip that content and go directly to the content of this show here, which was the X show, which was uh, something that we commissioned that, that we did ourselves to uh, research about the symbol of the X within punk rock, within hardcore, and how these two lines that are put together have this broad meaning, as you see within uh, the image on the upper right of, say, the crossed baseball bats and LAX, and this very simple marking, and how that all of a sudden gets taken hold of by a subculture, and then uh, becomes sort of uh, heightened over the course of subculture becoming more intense the next generation, and all of a sudden, uh, the X becomes a signal of um, total intensity. Okay, moving on. Street value. And, and Above the Pavement, the Farm were the first two books in the Inventory Book series. Um, which I edit and design as part of the work at the studio. Uh, this is also an instance of uh, us kind of trying to create situations. Uh, we sort of want to uh, take a set of content and uh, create the best home for it rather than, again, waiting for the, the prompt from the client. So this book is a book that's coming up uh, later this year. It's uh, by Jeffrey T. Schnapp and designed and edited by myself about the role of producers uh, within graphic design um, and books. Uh, and now for something completely different. Uh, Marshall McLuhan and Quentin Fury's War and Peace in the Global Village is one of the examples in the book. And again, it's just about um, Jerome Agel was one of the, is one of the, uh, oh God, I'm not gonna be able to make it through this slide, am I? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to talk quickly. It's the parameters of this thing, I don't know. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, Ellen and Andrew both talked about making your own tools, and this is a tool we made to help uh, you know, publish against the act of uh, making uh, authors making books, and we were interested in readers making libraries, and so this is a tool we built, which is a Tumblr theme in an Amazon.com book, bookmark that allows people to share their libraries. And so we're interested in making ways for people to participate and share things in new spaces and opportunities. Uh, I wrote an essay for the catalog about uh, teaching and, and the rise of MFA programs. On the left is the Bauhaus, on the right is a workshop we did at RISD, and I'm, we're encouraging uh, our students at RISD to uh, bring their practice out past the school. School is, is more than just a building, uh, and into the public realm. And so this is a, this is a, a, a pop-up shop we did in Brooklyn, and uh, it was at the Brooklyn Flea, and, and they were encouraged to make products about their thesis that actually were sold to the public and making design sort of more palatable and more, more, uh, more active for the public realm. Um, and so this idea of new venues is, it continues through our work for SALT, which is uh, included in the show here in the Walker. And uh, SALT is a museum in Istanbul. And for part of our uh, identity program for SALT, we were interested in the idea of a new venue being the institutional typeface itself. So the letters S-A-L-T in this typeface are actually a space for exhibition. And periodically, new designers are invited to change those letters. And so this is, thank you. Uh, this is the second, uh, second iteration by a Belgian designer named Dries Wewaters, uh, who sort of critiques the idea of the bank that's funding the project. Um, and it's, it, you know, in this way, we are able to kind of have a patina of different applications build up, and it fights sort of the fatigue of having to rebrand every three or four years. Instead, we, we kind of have opened up a participatory practice that brings people into Istanbul and gets them in dialogue with the museum. This is the website that presses in several, several of those typefaces at once. So here you see our first version there and Dries' second version there. Each of the things, the, the, the typeface talks about time and change um, and how the things build up. Uh, the last project we wanted to share was a project we did for the New York Times. Uh, they asked us to make a logo for Occupy Wall Street. We think the best representation of that is the occupation itself. 
we instead encouraged people to occupy the New York Times. Uh, and when they uh, told us they rejected that logo, <laughs> then we opened up a space for the public in the New York Times itself, which is bounded by one of the messages by the protesters, Occupy All. Thank you very much. Did you start already? Oof. Okay, so I have five posters and one object in the exhibition upstairs, and with this in mind, I thought I'd take my six minutes to attempt to deal with some of the issues uh, that I feel are at play in that work. Um, this type of work for me, poster design, represents a direct attempt to deal with the foundations of graphic design. Um, boy, it goes quick. <laughs> The five posters selected for the exhibit were actually part of a larger body of work uh, that consisted of 11 posters. These posters were essentially recruiting posters for Cranbrook Academy of Art. At Cranbrook, there are 10, art, uh, 10 departments with uh, 10 artists in residence, painting, photography, sculpture, 2D, 3D, ceramics. Uh, this is a picture of me in my studio, and in order to give you a better understanding of the context of my work, I'm gonna briefly describe uh, Cranbrook Academy of Art. Um, Cranbrook is a unique institution uh, and structured unlike any school in America. My role there is to be a working uh, designer and artist and to be the direct mentor to 15 students each year. Um, here's an overview. It's, it's uh, in fact, very different structurally. That's my daughter uh, from almost any other educational institution. And it's actually fairly, a fairly radical idea. We live in a 250-acre uh, educational community where there are no classes, no teachers, and no grades. <clears throat> um, the teachers are, in fact, artists in residence or designers in residence. Um, uh, artists in residence and families live together. Uh, yeah. So in this project, I designed 11 posters in 12 weeks. And in contrast to most of my work, the concept of these uh, pieces was not linguistically derived. In other words, in the poster on the right, uh, the conversion of St. Paul from 1995, the form and the pictorial space was derived directly from extrapolating on the idea of conversion as a metaphor, spiritual, sexual, religious, or educational conversion. Uh, so in most of my work, not only is the space conceived of syntactically, but often the forms are largely driven by the language. Uh, in this image, we see a conceptual map that I feel attempts to delineate uh, the conceptual terrain of, of my work over the past 15 years. Uh, and in most of this work, I've, uh, I've been largely in control of the linguistic content. So the, the posters that are in the show represent a, a very traditional form of, of design for me. Um, uh, yeah, oh, behind one. Uh, in the Cranbrook posters, there's essentially two things at play. The primary goal was to construct an extremely uh, contemporary image space. So in some ways, the pictorial space of the poster is informed by contemporary technologies. The second goal was an attempt to infuse the surfaces of the work with a kind of glistening dynamism, to construct surfaces that course with a kind of Dionysian power. <clears throat> My goal was to link these images uh, subconsciously to the power of the id and formally create holistic images that fuse the technological uh, with the power of the hand. Nothing in these pieces uh, is as they seem. As an example, the axonometric uh, typography looks initially as if it were uh, from a 3D program, but it's actually painted in egg tempera paint, and the 3D wireframe forms look like they're, um, they're from 3D as well, but they're meticulously hand-built. Um, so it's my contention that this kind of pictorial space could only have existed within a very narrow uh, historical window. And what, what, what I mean by this is that I'd postulate that in some of, of this work, we're actually looking at a, a believable pictorial space that seems to adhere to its own physical laws. Uh, it's my contention that it's not only technology that, uh, that allows us to compose space this way, but similar to some of John Berger's ideas, uh, it's technology that allows us to see this way. So here, as an example, we see digital technologies, hand-drawn elements, synthetically grown hair, three-dimensionally rendered elements, photographic elements, uh, wireframe data elements, false and possible perspective, and the commingling of flat, uh, uh, the flat and graphic with photographic. And all of that, the important point is all of that, I think, is composited, composited into a relatively <clears throat> cohesive and believable uh, pictorial space. Um, you know, we live in pornotopia, and our visual culture is directly steeped in the corporeal, corporeal language of porn. So in, a in turn, the language in these posters was constructed in such a way as to infuse uh, the work with a very present uh, corporeal quality. I wanted to articulate the surface with a kind of 
uh, palpable sexuality. Um, here you could project a, a conceptual connection to the work of Stephen Mizell or Bruce Weber. Um, Cubes. <laughs> so imagine an art school that allows you to, uh, to uh, um, create work like this. Um, in this entire body of work, there's a concern for flesh, sweat, hair, sex, secretion, and pubes. Uh, in essence, uh, um, while the overt communicative, communicative goal was to trans, uh, transmit the corporate values of Cranbrook, the subtext was to strip the pornographic of its pictorial and represent, representational quality while leaving its associative qualities intact. Uh, and although I'm, I'm discussing, currently discussing my, uh, this body of work in almost exclusively formal terms, uh, again, in this work, the challenge for me as a designer was to ruminate upon our contemporary cultural condition and make this work culturally relevant. So in other words, there was never an attempt in any of the, this work to be didactic um, with regard to the disciplines at Cranbrook. Uh, this poster, as an example, does not attempt to en uh, encapsulate or embody the overt concerns of the ceramics department as a whole. Um, the timing is, seems to be strange. Did you, you, you hit me with the one minute warning, didn't you? Yeah. Nice. All right. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just wait until some other image comes up. That's, uh, that's the fiber poster. So um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to close right under the wire with uh, just showing a taste of some of the other work that I do that deals much more um, overtly with political issues uh, and also uh, is more linguistically or syntactically derived, if I, if I can um, squeeze it in under the wire. So this was Elegy for the Collapse of the Empire, Detroit Craft and Disintegration at the Triennale uh, Design Museum in Milan in February. Um, I think the last slide will come up. Uh, so I'm, I'm showing this in order to, to kind of contrast the kind of work um, that is shown uh, here uh, with, with, uh, with this and to suggest that there's a, uh, a relationship between the two. And thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. We didn't script the ending. <laughs> Thank, I want to thank all of our speakers today for all their contributions. We're gonna um, the ex, the galleries will be open after um, right now. They're open actually till five, and uh, we'll be mingling around outside in the cafe or down here, down below. Thank you for coming. Thanks, speakers. Thank you.